My name is Catherine Stout and I'm the Director of Focal Point Gallery in South End on Sea. I'm delighted to welcome you today to a conversation between Hannah Quinlan, Rosie Hastings and Rosanna McLaughlin. Hannah Quinlan and Rosie Hastings live and work in London. They have participated in group shows including Kiss My Genders at the Hayward Gallery in London and Queer Spaces London 1980s to Today at the Whitechapel Gallery. Solo presentations include Something for the Boys at Two Queens Leicester and Gabby at Queer Thoughts New York City, both in 2018. Recent performances also took place for Image Behaviour at the ICA in London and Art Night, both 2019. They have recently been shortlisted for the 2020 Jarman Award. As a new body of work, In My Room, currently showing at Focal Point Gallery until the 30th of August, develops the artist's inquiry into the politics, histories and aesthetics of queer spaces and culture. This inquiry builds on their travels across the UK whilst making UK Gay Bar Directory 2016, a moving image archive of gay bars. The exhibition comprises of a new film which gave the exhibition its title that is set in three different locations, Bar Jester and the Court Club in Birmingham and Shoebury Ness Fort in Southend-on-Sea. Wall rubbings of the st stone relief that fronted the Bar Jester appear as a repeating motif throughout the film. These unique large works on paper are also presented on paper in the exhibition. Quillen and Hastings have also created a major new fresco painting at Focal Point Gallery, the first time they've used this medium, bringing this specialist ancient technique into contemporary practice. The exhibition will be presented at Most in Wales from mid-November and then at Humber Street Gallery Hull from spring 2021. They also have a forthcoming exhibition at Bertolozzi Gallery Berlin opening early November. They are joined today by Rosanna McLaughlin, who is a writer based in London, UK. She is an editor at The White Review, and her book Double Tracking was published by Car Carnegie Press in October 2019. Her essay, Now You See Me, which accompanies the exhibition in my room, can be found on Focal Point Gallery's website. I'm happy to now hand over to Hannah, Rosie and Rosanna to discuss their work and the exhibition in my room. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so for people who may be new to your work, maybe a good idea is to go right back to the beginning and talk about how you got into thinking about gay clubs, communities, public sex culture. Um, also because I know UK Gay Bar Directory, uh, part of that is on show at Focal Point Gallery, part, uh, as part of it um, in my room. Mm -hmm. um, and that work seems to me to underpin quite a lot of what you've made since. Um, so maybe I wanted to begin by asking you a question that I know that you've told me in the past, uh, you've been asked quite a few times, just why would two queer women focus on venues <laughs> that almost always cater to cisgendered gay men? So I'm Rosie, um, so I'll start by introducing our practice. So we started working together in 2014. Um, and we actually, our first collaboration was an event series called At Gay Bar, where we literally built our own gay bar in our bedroom, in studios, and then later on it became more of like a gallery thing. Um, and we would build these sort of installations and then we'd host events and parties and we sort of used it as a platform to critique main, um, mainstream gay bar culture and also to like build our own community and like opposition to what we saw as like the dominant culture, which, yeah, as you said, is like very like male centric. Um, and later on that sort of, um, I think from that sprung a uh, more kind of formal gallery practice and the UK Gay Bar Directory in 2016. Um, so the UK Gay Bar Directory is a moving image archive of gay bars in the UK. And we made it at a time when there was sort of like ramp, the rampant closure of um, venues like in London where we live and work and we later found out through our research that this was kind of epidemic across the UK so while we were filming venues were closing it's very dramatic nine months or so that we spent on the road um, and I think that's kind of where our I don't know so much of our work came from the research and our experiences and the conversations that we had in this period um, and especially 
the sort of experience of being two lesbians in this like very male dominated scene and kind of feeling very alien, like having to um, beg and beg our way into these male only spaces. Um, and sort of and you know we got into these crazy situations where we were entering venues mm. at 11 in the morning like with the cleaning staff because that was the only time like we were allowed to be seen like anywhere like within like five mile radius of them um and i think from the gay bar directory like we have often like chosen very certain locations that we wanted to kind of zone in on and um refocus and and we done that a lot through our film practice I think so through our, our first sort of big production film Something for the Boys um, which we made in 2018 in Blackpool and then for Focal Point Gallery um, in my room um, which was set in some um, a couple of venues in Birmingham um, so why do two lesbians <laughs> <laughs> why do two lesbians make work about um, gay, gay clubs maybe um, Hannah can answer that I I think part of the reason why it does feel like a particularly contentious question is that it implies that kind of as an artist your work has to I think it's a pressure specifically applied to kind of like um queer artists and female artists basically non-white male artists is that your art somehow has to be kind of self-portraiture almost and your body and your image has to be in your work and the way in which you talk about yourself is kind of through your image and i think what is freeing for us is in representing the dominant culture there is an obvious lack of us within that culture and yeah um it kind of feels like how can we begin talking about representing ourselves when there's all this stuff to tackle first and we are our identity almost is placed in opposition to these things. I guess that also relates to the the extent to which, as you're saying, the dominant culture also does represent people who, you know, may not see themselves in it because just, you know, because mm -hmm. it's the dominant culture. So I guess you are in those bars, you know, through your absence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, and it, we, we've always been interested in like portraying like a sort of realist portrayal of LGBTQ culture at this time. So we haven't been interested in constructing these like fantasy situations of something that doesn't exist. Like for us, it's more important to identify like what is dominant and then to be able to critique it and to um, pre present like a sort of complicated viewpoint that comes from being like a sort of lesbian in a gay male dominated situation um and i think in our practice like we're always interested in like locating the voice of power and voice power and then kind of analyzing it and deconstructing it and representing it um and it and and so yeah it's kind of just our work is just it just reflects what exists basically you said um, that some of the very early work that you made was producing like a, a bar of your own. Mm. Is that something that you don't, because that's kind of a more of a utopian kind of like a vision of what you might like it to be mm. like. Is that like, has that part of your practice kind of fallen away now? Or is that still something that you... Yeah. Um, I think, as, I, don't, I don't think it's a fact of, because obviously there are alternative spaces that exist and often yeah they exist within kind of like one night events and it's not that there is no alternative culture i think what we were interested in, in is which section of what's perceived as um kind of an oppressed group being like lgbtq people is able to kind of rise to the top of that group and kind of who sacrificed in order for them to be like granted this protection like and, seat at the table yeah um, so I think we became interested in, yeah, who, yeah, like who's, who's got the power basically, but in terms of our own work, like, yeah, we used to, we used to put a lot of our energies into like hosting and creating and constructing these sort of worlds that didn't, we didn't think existed. Um, but just logistically the challenge of like running 
the bar was so overwhelmingly intense and like it was just this crazy situation where we were both working like almost full time and then we'd be putting all the money that we earned into building these bars and then I don't know it just ground I guess it just it wasn't sustainable which could be also said of like running an actual gay bar and, you know why it's kind of so difficult but to maintain them for a long period of time as a yeah i mean i guess also like like you say the almost complete like lack of um like as an example like visibility of lesbian clubs that's a lot to take on yeah <laughs> you know yeah. because there's a reason why there aren't so many right like there's like it's a complex uh, web of reasons yeah it did feel really complicated it felt like you know like also just the dra the queer drama was that was almost like the hardest thing. It's like all these groups coming in, like people having fights and things popping off. Like it was just, yeah, it was a bit too much for us to um, kind of handle. And it just became like, we started putting kind of what we'd seen in, more into like our drawings and, and our films, um, I think, yeah. One of the things that I, um, yeah, that I, I have really liked about your work since I first saw it was that it kind of chimes with this feeling of imposter syndrome that I always had when I was like a teenager, like the first like LGBTQ place I went to was uh, like a men's gay bar. And like the only representation on TV that I like sort of, that was like credibly queer, I suppose, was gay men. Um, and so you, I think like a lot of people, you end up sort of identifying with a culture that isn't really catering to you of just because, you know, like with LGBTQ, people think only really, well, they say LGBTQ, but normally they just mean G. Mm -hmm. um, they get kind of uh, like represented by something that isn't really for you. Um, and I like that tension that it makes in your, in your films and in your drawings too, the kind of familiarity with a place, um, a kind of sense of like haunting and loss or something like that kind of and yeah in uk gay bar directory like the emptiness of the bars <laughs> were particularly poignant for that reason yeah yeah i think we decided not to respect the i think we decided not to like respect the barriers of access that um have sort of been established by these like institutions of gayness and and yeah like as you said like the com the universal coming out experience is going on the whole to like a male dominated um gay bar and and having that utopian moment that then as like a woman gets like shattered when you realize that you know it's a culture that you're mostly kind of excluded from or that you're not represented by and trying to within that trying to find yourself within that like gay dominated like male um culture and trying to take a bit of it for yourself and like take ownership of it and it can often like create these quite like warped i don't know warped feelings and experiences mm, i'd also say something else that's kind of feels quite special in your in your work is that it isn't simplistically moral because it would be kind of easy to you know say like oh you know uh like other queer people are excluded from these places like you know you need to kind of like change and become more inclusive because at the same time like you also seem to be reflecting on the fact that these places are all like you know on the brink of shutting down forever more <laughs> so it's yeah there's like there's like i think that's what gives the work its kind of tension or its atmosphere is that it's a very complex kind of set of like of morals that don't really match up which seems to be so much of like where we're at now or like where queer culture is at now i think there's there's definitely a tension within our work between what maybe seen as quite a dated idea of gay culture and now I think people what people overwhelmingly identify with is queer culture which is um, sort of very linked to kind of solidarity with multiple so social justice issues and maybe kind of this dated idea of gay culture is seen as aligning itself with um, kind of normative white masculinity and it's seen as um kind of like a trans exclusionary place and a place that excludes women and i think what i don't know what you've seen recently is kind of like um like a very a very kind of purposeful turn away from like this old culture kind of like this idea of like 
1980s gay masculinity. Um, and I think obviously you still overwhelmingly venues that exist in like UK cities, they are, they do represent this kind of old, old school gay identity. And I think what's interesting is kind of, yeah, the fact that this tension has become so prevalent. So what you have is people kind of mourning the closure of venues and connecting it to gentrification, but also ultimately the fact that large swathes of the queer community, they don't want to go to these venues. They feel excluded by these venues. They feel like these venues don't represent them. So it's, I don't know, there is a tension and it's kind of the same people that critique these venues are also the people who, yeah, as you say, they mourn their loss. And so I think it's a really complicated relationship. Yeah. And I think in our work as well, like we're always trying to find that point between celebration and critique and never to have like a sort of monolithic voice. Like it's all, and so for instance, in my room, like we were talking about like male power and gay spaces. We also wanted to represent them as a place that's in a sort of moment of crisis or a, a moment where the future has suddenly become very unclear. Like, for instance, we decided to shoot our film in Birmingham because we, when we went there in 2016 while filming the Gay Bar Directory, like we, it was so dominated by male only sex clubs, basically. And that's why we returned there. But when we got there, you know, this year, every single male only venue had either closed or was, a, on, was about to close and that completely changed the narrative of our film it made it more you know like suddenly there was this like really important feeling that we had to like archive and document these venues that that have you know it been open since the 1970s and it just brought it's just about all these kind of layers of what I don't know it's always yeah it always feels like there's never one meaning or one one purpose when we're working on something um and it also feels really important for us to, they like while well, making work about like public sex and male only gay culture is that we're not advocating for the closure of male only spaces um we really understand the value of them and want them to exist and um, but you know what we what we're interested in is thinking about how these male only sex spaces have ramifications um culturally socially politically um and thinking about how ways in which like maybe this power could be redistributed or and the ways in which like the male sex club sort of um reinforces like the status quo um and that as being something like worth analyzing maybe this is a, a good opportunity to go into the film in my room which is kind mm -hmm. of the sort of centerpiece i suppose of, of the exhibition um you mentioned that you filmed part of it in birmingham um yeah could you just explain what some of the venues were because there were a few of them and they yeah had a quite specific relationship with them um so the two venues we filmed in were both actually they're both owned by the same owner um so one of them is jester which as rosie said was actually open first opened in the 1970s and has kind of gone through different stages up until now and it has recently closed I think about it must it, it must be about five months ago now it closed its doors it closed like three weeks before we filmed started filming it um so and then there's also core club which is a um a newer venue which is exclusively male only and runs so it's not consistently open every night it runs kind of like special nights normally like um, xxl burning in yeah kind of like sex nights specifically for like diff different demographics within like the gay male community so like bear nights and different fetish nights um so we we first encountered jester when we were filming the uk gay bar directory and i think as rosie mentioned earlier birmingham birmingham had been a city that we had had um, particular trouble in documenting because we weren't actually able to access a lot of the venues so there was part of us that constantly had this thing where it was like oh we want to go back there because we want to be able to kind of access these spaces and film in these places that we weren't able to access the first time around and it also was um, kind of the city that had the most it was this weird thing where it was the most robust gay scene in that it seemed quite unaffected by the specific issues facing gay venues in 2016 
And at the same time, it was the most gay male only kind of scene out of all the cities that we came across in the UK. So I think we had this, I guess this kind of, um, what would you say when something, we were just drawn to it, it when we started of, wanting to work with It's kind of this massive, what's that word? Masochistic. Masochistic, like, obsession with <laughs> Birmingham. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also, like, geographically, it's such an interesting city because, um, you know, like, the gay scene is, like, right in the centre of town next to Bullring, which is, like, yeah, it's, like, the main, has a main fruit bear of Birmingham. It's, like, right next to the, um, the station. Um, but at the same time, it felt, like, quite geographically cut off from the center because it was surrounded on one side by this massive kind of a road motorway and then on the and all this kind of barren unused land that was just empty and neglected and it kind of had this so it felt like this robust and thriving gay scene but that was also like quite geographically cut off all, and it kind of gave a sense of like dislocation within the city or ghettoization um, which was quite unique. Um, but then coming back there in 2019, um, it was a completely different landscape. All this sort of barren and unused land had been divided up and was being transformed very quickly, I imagine, into kind of luxury apartment blocks and um, that alongside this massive spate of venue closures. Like it was a completely different um, very gentrified sort of version of what we had experienced in 2016. Um, so that really, yeah, it really became part of the film, I think. And so when you went into uh, the Jester Bar, was it at that point, it had closed down when you were doing the filming? Yeah, we actually knew the manager from when we went in 2016. He was like, we just spent like this crazy evening with him where he kind of just chatted, he just chatted to us for ages, didn't he? And so we got in touch with him and we said, oh, you know, we're really interested in coming back to um, Jester to film properly. And he said, oh, that's so sad because we actually just closed like two weeks ago, but his owner's email. Um, and then we just got into this weird bargaining spiral where we ended up going to Birmingham like three times in one week just to try and kind of pin him down and get into the venues and make a deal with him. And he was quite a strange guy. Like he he felt very disconnected from the sort of overall health of the community. And he primarily saw himself as a business man and he saw these gay bars as a kind of failed business venture. Um, so yeah, it's just quite, quite an interesting insight. Um, the film is kind of almost like operatic. I was thinking when I was <laughs> watching it, you know, it's like very, um, it has a real like, epic quality to it and also kind of something like almost like a noirish like horror yeah <laughs> so, i think it's a bit funny <laughs> yeah it's quite yeah. like campy in a way it's quite camp yeah it's really whatever when we make films like we really like we always say to like owen who makes the music we're like make it more hardcore like make it dark and make it more extreme like we really we always try and push like everything to like its absolute maximum um, yeah. I wanted to ask you about the main, like the song that like the, the film kicks off with, which is also the name of the film and the show, which is like, I don't think she wrote it, but Nancy Sinatra sung it in my room. And it's a really kind of, I was l listening to it again this morning in about the conversation. And it's almost like, it's kind of, it's sad, the sort of sad, tragic story of someone that's been, that's been left behind, but it also has this feeling of almost like a revenge is brewing. Yeah, yeah. it felt so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I wondered why you specifically had like chosen it and like yeah. You know, well, we, we actually knew about the Mark Armand cover of it, um, and originally like we actually wanted to cast Mark Armand in the film. It's been like this long-term obsession of ours. Um, but then working with Jesse was actually way better. Um, but I guess we were thinking about this idea of like the gay club being the room of the man who's you know kind of going there and t the the sort of customer having this sort of sense of ownership over the space and his experience that almost like it's an extension of his bedroom and that being um that being an experience that's kind of like afforded to these you know gay guys going to sex clubs like their their sort of private world can extend into the public space um so yeah i think that's where I, that's what the song just really yeah it felt like a fit and and then we ended up using it to the name of the the show
do you think of the film as having um, a narrative? Because it's sort of split into roughly three sections. You have like the the two men dancing, and then those those men end up in the woods, which is yeah. like high horror, um, <laughs> like <the> stripping <laughs> section. Yeah, because it's quite anxiety inducing. You know, it's like, yeah. quite like a libidinal. You know, you don't know if it's a good or a hook up. You know, it, there's a kind of threat lingering. Yeah. And then, and then it there's this amazing like shift of like tone when all of a sudden it, like you, you you leave this kind of sort of scary scene to the, the line dancing. Oh yeah. Outside the fort, which is like a real like mood shift. So the yeah. film begins in kind of a series, a dance series that's shot in the Jester Club and in Core Club. And it's a dance happening between Ted Rogers, who's a dancer we've worked with in the past on um, on performances and in our last film, Something for the Boys. And in this scene is also Matthew Hawkins, who's an older dancer who's worked a lot with the Michael Clark Dance Company. Um, and they're kind of engaged in, it's kind of a dance that we worked with the choreographer Les Child and it was inspired by this video we found on YouTube of these two, it was these two kind of like cowboys in America practicing a shadow dance. We called it a shadow dance, but I didn't actually know what the dance is called, but they're kind of standing, they're both dressed almost identically in jeans and boots and they're both mimicking each other's movements. So you have um, Ted on the inside and then Matthew on the outside and they kind of, kind of this human centipede type dance where they're like mimicking each other's movements. Um, and so it goes from being quite intimate and kind of loving to quite almost like they're fighting. Yeah, at moments. Yeah. And I think we were with that dance, we were interested in the idea of these two kind of different generations mimicking each other's movements in this quite repetitive kind of approach to the way they were performing their masculinity in these clubs. Yeah, we're thinking about like how the sort of codes and rituals of masculinity and especially like in a gay club where like a lot of communication is non-verbal dance felt like a really um useful way to sort of express this culture um and so a lot of the movements in the shadow dance and and then the line dance later on are, yeah they're quite repetitive and it's about how this culture of masculinity kind of becomes ingrained through behaviors um not just in the gay club but in wider society as well yeah and then from this scene, it goes on to what we always refer to as kind of the strip scene. So mm -hmm. it's this kind of montage where it's, it flicks between this scene in the woods, kind of filmed at night, where the torchlight is the only thing allowing you to see like a certain part of the forest at once. And then that's split with kind of um, this strip scene, which is... Um, so characters like stripping into the camera so they're walking towards the camera and they're removing one item of clothing at a time and it's almost like they're in a trance um and the audio is like super intense like these sort of industrial quite scary noises so, yeah it's got quite a hol as you said operatic horror film quality to it and then you get this like kind of chanting this like quite strong big male energy chanting almost like what you'd hear in a football game um and it's a, and with that we were just trying to think about how this individual man taking off his clothes about how this simple gesture sort of connected him to this vast culture of masculinity um and he sort of like plugged into this matrix of power um so yeah that's what we were kind of thinking about that but it's in this sort of like quite almost like sci-fi over dramatic kind of way um mm -hmm. and then and then the woods it's weird because obviously the obvious connection to the woods is the fact that cruising takes place in the woods but i think for some reason that had just totally not been our entry point yeah. to the woods and it's it more been, like the psychological woods it was more like <laughs> as you say with the in my room song it's got this very like gothic kind of edge to it and it's i think we were interested in like the this quite primal feeling of being in the woods in the dark and this idea of risk. And in the show, we were kind of exploring how risk is like an essential quality of sex clubs and risk is linked to this idea of pleasure and how this is kind of very specific to an idea of like male sexuality in which risk is seen as kind of like 
erotic an erotic quality rather than a dangerous kind of quality that's going to actually put you at real risk so it's kind of this performance of risk yeah it's kind of in a sex club how you get these mazes like these maze dungeons and I don't know that was almost like the the dark forest isn't it it's like yeah. you don't know you know it's all about accentuating the darkness and the shadows and you don't know what's around the corner you don't know who's lurking there and who's watching you and and so I think that's what yeah that's what came out of the um that that's that was all linked to like choosing the forest as one of the locations um and then, and then when you when the um the film moves on to Shubarine S4, it kind of switches into something that's a bit more like a homo social dance. Yeah. Kind of, you know, two people involved in this kind of um, yeah. sexual so, exchange. Yeah, so we chose Shubarine S4 because, on one hand, like it was very interesting because it was. Um, it's a military fort that was used for training riflemen in the Second World War. Um, but we also really loved how you have that on one side and then on, on the back, on the other side, you have these like new affluential houses, like these very new built. Um, and it kind of, I don't know, it kind of, so that, that kind of mirrored what was felt like was happening in Birmingham somehow. But um, in terms of like using the military fort, I think, I think we're interested in how like this male sex culture and this culture of sex in public, how it almost, it almost links more back to a wider culture of masculinity um, than to LGBTQ culture kind of necessarily. And it's more almost like a male issue, not like a gay issue somehow. Um, and partly this was um, from, I guess, doing research when we did the gay bar directory and when speaking to like a lot of the managers of sex clubs, you know, they would say like, oh, most of the guys who come here have wives and they just come here, at like almost, they use it like as this sort of leisure activity and they use it um, in the same way you would kind of use a gym or something. And we, we found, thought that was so fascinating that, um, you know, within heterosexuality and heteromasculinity, there was a space for sex between men that, didn't necessarily impact on your identity as a straight man. And, and we thought, wow, that's so amazing, like how strong and powerful the identity of straight man is, that it can accommodate for these supposedly deviant sexual practices. Um, and we kind of thought about how, in that sense, this sex between men becomes something that's almost masculinity boosting. Um, and it's almost, I don't know, and that made us think about these different institutions that you think of as like being heavily masculine, like the military, um, and um, and it made us think about, you know, it was almost became this thing about tracing lines of power that starts, you know, how what is a link between the military and the gay club? Like it sounds quite extreme, but I think that was, I don't know, just sort of tracing this power from the bedroom to like the boardroom to the wall room like that yeah that was really fascinating for us mm -hmm. um so that's yeah that's kind of what we why we chose that location and i guess also our view of public sex within the film was kind of placing itself in opposition to this idea that sex between men in public is kind of like an act which like diminishes like class boundaries or racial boundaries and it's kind of this utopia utopian melting pot of like different identities in which it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or black um, or white it kind of just means that everyone's equal and like your interactions with people are completely untouched by these identity politics and i think through kind of looking at this military venue we were kind of looking at as Ro as rosie says how this kind of sex this sex in public was actually it was another extension of these kind of like masculine white institutions and it wasn't this utopian. Yeah, it's almost like resisting this romanticism within queer theory, I guess. That's what yeah. you're saying. Um, yeah. as a and a way of examining, you know, cruising as as radic you know, radical and politically inflammatory act. Yeah. Often you'll hear people saying, you know, with bars as well as with um like public mm -hmm. sex culture, that like, you know, it's just the matter of people who aren't gay men like why don't why doesn't everyone else get their bars you know why doesn't everyone else just yeah. like you know get to work having a cruising culture but it's, yeah. I guess you know it's kind of interesting with the military is like this 
other thing that comes along, it's like, well, maybe equality is not also being able to join the military and also having this kind of like interaction with power in like public sex spaces, if that makes sense. Like the answer isn't yeah. always that. Okay. Men have got, like maybe that there's another kind of a discourse or another type of like culture mm. um, that isn't paid attention to. Uh, the other, yeah, I, I also really wanted to ask you about like working with Les Child. Oh um, yeah. And like what it's like, like to collaborate with a choreographer, like how that process works. I mean, it's funny because when we, we just had this weird moment where we, because Les used to dance and we kind of knew about <laughs> Les's dancing. And it was so funny. We called Les up and we were like, we really want you as a dancer. And he was like, what are you talking about? Like, I am not going to dance. Like, no way. I'm a choreographer. And we were like, fuck. Well, we actually, to work it took Les. about three phone calls yeah. <laughs> until we realized that we he were so confused. We were hiring him as a choreographer and we thought we were hiring him as a dancer. And then it suddenly he clicked. Like, it suddenly clicked that we both had the wrong end of the stick. But it was so fortunate because it was amazing to work with Les. Like, he completely elevated like our work with dancers. And I don't know, I think. You know, when it comes to dance, we're com it's something that we've worked with, but we're also kind of complete amateurs. And that's what's so amazing about being an artist is you can kind of just follow your instinct, go anywhere, do anything. Um, and you don't have to be an expert. You just, you just kind of make it happen. But working with Les, yeah, really kind of elevated that side of our practice. Um, and he's obviously got such an, in you know, he was very like involved in like the British voguing scene and he's worked with, Kind of like the craziest celebrities and he kind of seen it all knows it all um so he totally and he totally understood where we were coming from um yeah i think it's just having someone who totally understands kind of the vocab vocabulary of dance and is able to kind of communicate ideas that we can explain to him in a very simple way and kind of make it real and yeah make it a lot stronger than i think what we would have been able to do without less helping us um yeah, it was really, it was really good to be able to see that. Yeah, we're very honoured to work with him. Do you find that you now have like the beginnings of a dance vocabulary because you've been dancers incorporated quite a lot right, in your work? No, we don't. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think, for example, <laughs> I'm not going to pretend. <laughs> I know Ted, for example, would probably be very dismissive of the idea of like a formal dance, dance vocabulary. vocabulary, and I think he's very interested in the idea of dance being kind of infinitely accessible and it isn't something that should only be available to kind of professional trained dancers and so I think and I also think that's something that probably Les would share because he does kind of movement direction so working with not only not dancers, dancers but kind of yeah so I think dance in that way is a very accessible medium in that kind of everyone has yeah. a body and everyone moves in space and kind of like everyone has this relationship to their emotions and kind of their body language so I think especially in relation to kind of queer history and like using you know like the the club as a and the dance floor as a space of queer cultural production at a time when and dance, you know queer culture and like I think the surprise like all minority cultures is that you know dance is a vocabulary and it's a way of speaking about your identity and it's a way of speaking about your history in a way that can't necessarily be censored in the same way that your words can or that um so I think you know there's like a real important I don't know I just think the link in between dance and queer kind of world making is really important and, and it is it's not a professionalized that is not a professionalized area of dance it's it's more like a social social area of dance um so yeah i think that's what we're we're more interested in accessing it from dance from the club than the, the stage if that makes sense yeah it's one of like a number of uh like art forms that you have like in recent years started working in mm -hmm. having maybe begun working with uh like archival footage or the production mm -hmm. of archival footage and the other like major one is fresco making oh yeah <laughs> yeah also um a very kind of invested and in, like i imagine complicated thing to produce like how did you begin making frescoes um so i think when we began drawing we ended up being 
drawn heavily to like cert certain kind of art historical references. So we immediately began with this kind of obsession with Michelangelo's drawings. It's a very like uh, stereotypical entrance into Italian Renaissance art history. But I think, um, yeah, and from there we, we just before the show at Focal Point, we visited this, um, the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> we got to see, um, I think we were just, a lot of our work is kind of looking at architecture and obviously fresco is a form of art that is literally painted onto the walls. So we were interested in this relationship to spaces and kind of like the permanence of it and the way it kind of informed the spaces that it was within. And you could, it's not, it wasn't an art form that was kind of, it's not this 2D art form that is applied to something and can be moved around. It's like becomes integral to the actual walls of a building. Like the landscape. Yeah, and I think we were drawn to that element of it. Um, but also that fresco, like often in society, has played quite a kind of instructive role. It's like quite often quite encoded, with like the moral, um, the sort of like moral compass that society is supposed to abide by. Like I was like looking at the murals last night that are in the Old Bailey, and they all are based on, and this is like the sort of, you know center for justice in in the uk and um they're all based on these proverbs from the bible and you know i it, i just was so interested in that because it just shows how the whole this whole um idea of justice is so underpinned by these western christian values that kind of almost like feel like they have no role in what contemporary justice should be and and how this has been like the source of i guess so many um issues in the justice system um but yeah it's it's often the kind of place where you would find a fresco and and just in terms of the show we were thinking about the urban environment and how it's um gendered and how um different bodies move through it um so fresco felt like quite an obvious direction that could link our passionate love for the Italian Renaissance with a critique of the urban environment. <laughs> Apple and the Focal Point Gallery. Yeah. <laughs> um, same, same. So yeah, the learning to do it was, it wasn't easy. Um, yeah, it's kind of, I think because there isn't many practitioners, it is, it's, because at the moment, I feel like now it's like you can Google anything and Google will just tell you how to make it or there'll be a tutorial on YouTube, but Fresco somehow was just not part of that internet culture. It's just totally not accessible. So you end up reading kind of like... Renaissance There'll be a, cha a chapter in like a Renaissance handbook that talks about it. And then, but we have, um, we got put in touch with, I think Catherine tracked down a practitioner called Blair Kelly who... Uh, was living in Toulouse and she amazingly um, committed to doing a week-long workshop with us in which she went over all the basics so we managed to learn how to execute fresco technically. It was, it was very stressful though like trying to even just to get the right plaster which is like a very specific bespoke mixture um, we had to go through like three different suppliers we had so much wrong plaster mixture sent to our studio um it was really kind of wading it felt like we were really like wading against um history somehow as artists um but but yeah i think we managed pretty well in the end made the, a fresco the fresco that is on show is based on flagellation uh-huh right that andrea yeah. Mantegna. um is it an engraving the original or what what i don't yeah. know what yeah. But, um, so it's a biblical scene of Christ being whipped against the pole. <laughs> you have kind of switched and then put in a, in a street, and all the in the scene are now women. Um, you, yeah, describe like what what you took, what you wanted to take from the original artwork, the Mantegna artwork, and how you trans transformed that into yeah something within your own practice. Yeah, I think we were interested in kind of the extreme kind of characterization that goes on in this kind of biblical image. So you have kind of Jesus who represents this kind of martyr who sacrifices everything kind of against the grain of society for his belief in what he feels is right. And then kind of like the Roman 
perpetrators of violence who are kind of state sanctioned um kind of a policing force so you have these very kind of like contemporary relevant kind of like characters and i think that's what initially drew us into the image um but obviously we're not represented i think what we wanted to do is kind of complicate these quite simplistic as rosie says like moral guiding kind of way of using an image to kind of illustrate a moral idea um and so we depicted kind of like a street on a sorry a british high street kind of inhabited by this group of women kind of engaged in this violent conflict <laughs> and some of them kind of walking past and ignoring it and some of them so yeah it was kind of this morally ambiguous moment in which you're not really sure who's perpetrating violence who's a victim yeah so. i think it yeah i think it came back to this moment of like I don't know, we were on a panel like a year ago and somebody said to us like, oh, I can't even imagine what like a lesbian club would look like. I can't even imagine what a woman only sex club would look like. And I think we, that, we've always, and since then I've been, I think we've been really interested in like, oh, you know, like what would a, a woman only space look like? And I don't know, somehow, somehow like we came up with this like very fractious like and, and violent scene. Um, and I think that, it was once again like not trying to represent like a fantasy idea of like a fantasy idea of like what a, a lesbian space would look like because in in reality like the le you know like the uk lesbian scene is incredibly divided with various warring fractions um and it has been kind of historically as well so i i guess it was about summoning that sort of yeah that in that sort of conflict almost which is also um yeah like a kind of a similar mood in the drawings outside mm -hmm. clubs in where you, it's kind of anxious and mm -hmm. erotic kind of violent all at the same time yeah and we're thinking about like specifically like how i guess white women like men have also weaponized their gender um to establish dominance and power and often at the expense of you know like non-white women and trans women and obviously like the anti-trans voice is such a strong is such a strong um voice in feminism at the moment so um i think it was yeah summoning this kind of discord and this messiness almost with using fresco paintings you know there's it's very kind of um like old world epic uh and maybe that's something echoed in your um, rubbings um, uh, jest you took from Bar Jester, which has like historically been used for um, like um, classic classicists that um, like <laughs> fan Victorian times who wanted to go and take rubbings from like ancient you can like, ancient Roman stone carvings and also tombstones. Um, yeah. And so that felt like another kind of like type of archaeology or historicizing of a moment that is very poignant, but it's not quite clear maybe when we're living within it, like what the outcome is or like what the significance will be to these closures or these kind of divisions within the scene. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's interesting specifically in relation to the jester sign, because I think it's something that even though it's kind of a venue that's been open since the 1970s and that jester sign itself had, has gone through kind of many different stages like it's been painted over at, at points and it's been bordered over at different points and i don't think um kind of in a mainstream sense it would be thought of as kind of like an important monument within birmingham because ultimately it's kind of like this thing attached to a bar and i think it is obviously overlooked as like a integral part of the city um so i guess it's the kind of thing where now that the venue is closed it's kind of at the mercy of the next owner whether or not that even remains there i mean the actual current owner told us <laughs> that he was going to put it in his garden so i think we know for sure that yeah so it's yeah. it's not it's not like a i guess it's interesting because what what you're saying is it's a practice that would normally be used to document something that already has kind of a respect and kind of like you want that that object kind of has a guarantee that it will survive history almost and 
I guess we were using it to document something that even though structurally it's incredibly solid, like the same kind of materials you would find in like, yeah, a like tomb. a church or a tomb. It's something that is very ephemeral. Yeah, very ephemeral. Um, well, thank you so much, Rosanna and Catherine, for hosting us on this podcast. Um, and thank you, Rosanna, for such brilliant questions. Um, it's really nice to talk about our show with you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Rosanna. That, that was a great discussion. And um, yeah, thank you.